of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Hello, dear listeners. We are continuing to read from the book With Pain and Love for Contemporary Men, the first volume in the series Spiritual Counsels by Saint Paisios. Chapter 4 The Orthodox Tradition Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13 verse 8 Yeroda People often talk about church renewal as if the church is getting old and needs to be rejuvenated. Yes, she got old even people who do not have reverence but do have some sense cannot find comfort in the new things made these days. So they go off in search of things made in the past. New icons, for example, do not move them. They now appreciate the value of old icons. If this happens with people who have a little sense, just imagine how much more moved are those who have devotion. This should tell you how wrong all this talk about renewal is. Today, even someone who tries just a bit to remain faithful to tradition, to maintain the fasts, abstain from work on feast days, and is devout, is subject to ridicule. Where does he think he is? Those things are no more, they're for the past. And if you respond, they will continue. In which era do you live? Nobody does those things today. Slowly, they are taking traditions, fasting and reverence, and making them into fairy tales. But do you remember what the Gospel says? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. If you cannot observe our tradition, at least say, My God, I have sinned. Then God will be merciful. But that's not what happens nowadays. These people, although they are spiritually weak, try to impose their views on others because their conscience bothers them. Take a person who is possessed by a demon and put him in a spiritual environment. He will not be able to sit still because he will feel coerced. It's the same with these folks. Their conscience bothers them. They are under pressure and they say all these things in order to suppress their conscience. They call our values status quo and try to replace traditional values with disorder. There is so much perversion out there. They consider spiritual beauty ugliness. Judged by their secular standards, spiritual beauty is worldly ugliness. Imagine grabbing a monk and cutting his hair, how ugly he would become. And yet, this type of ugliness 
is what worldly people consider beautiful. You see, now they fight the church to try to destroy her. I understand their point. They don't believe in God and preach atheism. But why do they refuse to recognize the many good things that the church has to offer and are always against her? This is very malicious. Why don't they acknowledge that the church actually protects children, keeps them from turning into little hooligans, and helps them become good human beings? Instead, by propelling children on the path to evil, they give them free license to destroy themselves. This is not what the church does. It teaches them to be prudent, to show respect to other people, and to be chaste so that they will grow up to be good and wholesome human beings. This will not last. Things will fall into place again. In Russia, in a church, an old lady was praying on her knees next to a pillar. A young woman, a great scientist, goes up to her and says, This is old-fashioned. And the old woman answered her, Right here, by this very pillar, where you now see me weeping, you too will weep one day. Your ways will come and go. They will become outdated. But Christianity will never become outdated. Respect for Tradition Many holy martyrs who did not know how to explain the doctrines of the Church used to say, What I believe is what the Holy Fathers have taught. That was enough to lead them to martyrdom. You see, they could not defend their faith with arguments and persuade those that persecuted them, but they trusted the Holy Fathers. This is what the martyrs thought. How can I not trust the Holy Fathers? They were far more experienced and virtuous and holy than we are. How can I accept this nonsense people are saying and not protest when they abuse them? Let's have faith in holy tradition. Unfortunately, these days everyone tries to make a showcase of how good they are because they have allowed the European spirit of politeness and courtesy to become a priority. Wanting to show how superior their courtesy is, they end up bowing to the two-horned devil. There should be only one religion, they say. In this way, they put everything on the same level. I have even had visitors who have told me this. Those of us who believe in Christ should form one religion. What you are suggesting, I replied, is that we take 18 karat gold that has been purified and separated from copper and mix it with copper again. Does this make any sense? Ask a jeweler. Does it make sense to mix junk with gold? So many have struggled to polish this dogma and make it shine. The Holy Fathers were right to forbid relations with heretics. Today we hear, we should pray together, not only with the heretic, but also with the Buddhist, the fire worshiper, even the demon worshiper. It is important that the Orthodox participate in conferences and be present at their prayer sessions. What kind of presence are they talking about? They try to solve everything using logic and end up justifying the unjustifiable. According to the European spirit, we should include spiritual matters in the common market. Among the Orthodox, some who are rather weak in their belief seek to promote themselves through self-appointed missionary work. They organize conferences with the heterodox 
thinking that by promoting orthodoxy in this way, as if it were a taramo salata on the salad bar with the heterodox, they are creating a sensation. This gets the super zealots angry and they go to the other extreme. They blaspheme against the mysteries of the new calendar orthodox and so on and thoroughly scandalize souls who are full of devotion and orthodox sensitivity. The heterodox, on the other hand, come to these conferences, behave as if we all have to learn from them, and then take whatever good spiritual material they find in orthodoxy, process it in their labs, add their own colors and labels, and present it as an original idea. And the strange people of today who find such strange things moving are later spiritually destroyed by these very things. When it is necessary, however, the Lord will bring forth great figures like St. Mark the Evgenikos and St. Gregory Palamas who will gather together all our scandalized brothers and sisters to confess the Orthodox faith and secure the Orthodox tradition, bringing great joy to our Mother, the Church. If we lived in the spirit of the Church Fathers, we would be full of spiritual health, which would be the envy of the heterodox. Seeing our example, they would then abandon their ill-conceived beliefs and be saved without the need of preaching. As things are now, they are not moved by our patristic tradition because they want to also see the continuation of that patristic tradition, the actual relations we have with our saints. Every orthodox person is obliged to generate in the heterodox a good kind of concern so that they will realize their errors and not rest in false beliefs, which would deprive them of the rich blessings of orthodoxy in this life and of the abundant and eternal blessings of God in the next. A group of young Catholic men came to my Kalivi. They were very eager and interested to learn more about orthodoxy. Please tell us something that will help us spiritually, they said. Look, I replied, go and take a look at church history and you will see that a long time ago we were united. And then consider what has brought you where you are today. This will really help you. Do this, and when you come back, we'll have a lot to talk about. In the old days, people had respect for things. They treated their grandfather's belongings like heirlooms. I knew a very successful lawyer. His house was simple, and visitors felt at ease there. Once he said to me, Father, a few years ago, my friends made fun of my old furniture. Now they come and admire them as antiques. But this is not how I see them. I enjoy using them because they remind me of my father, my mother, my grandparents. I am really moved by them. They, by contrast, collect various types of old furniture and turn their living rooms into flea markets so that they can forget themselves with these things and somehow forget their worldly anxiety. In the past, even a tiny gold coin inherited from one's mother or grandfather was treasured as if it were a great fortune. Today, if someone can exchange a King George pound with a Victoria, for only a marginal profit, he will sell it, even though it was his grandfather's. There is little appreciation for one's mother or father. 
they are not taken into account. The European spirit is slowly entering our lives and sweeping us away. I remember when I first went to the holy mountain, I met a very old and pious man. He was the elder of a small fellowship of monks. Such was his reverence for his own elders and spiritual predecessors that he had kept everything they had once owned. He kept not only their kalimavkia, the monastic head coverings, but also the forms used to make them. He also kept old books and manuscripts of all kinds, carefully wrapped and locked in a bookcase to protect them from the dust. He never used those books, but kept them closeted away. I am not worthy to read these books, he would say. I just read the simple books, the Yerendikon, the St. John of the Ladder, Klimakos. Later, a young monk came to stay with him. He eventually left the holy mountain and said to him, Why have you collected all this junk? He was ready to throw away the casts and burn them. So the poor old man started weeping. This one is from my elder, he would plead. Why does it bother you? We have so many rooms. Find a corner and put them there. He was so full of reverence that he kept everything. The books, the heirlooms, the kalimavkia, even those worn-out casts. You see, when we show respect for small things, we will show even more respect for bigger things. But where small things are not respected, big things will not be respected either. This is how the Holy Fathers managed to preserve the tradition of the Church. Time-tested practices should be retained in monasticism. Yeroda, when a sister who is new to a post finds a certain order in the way things are arranged, is it right for her to make changes? No, she should not start by making any changes, even if she is the only person working in that post. Some of the new brotherhoods who moved into old monasteries did that. They did not respect the old-timers' experience. When people put in place their own programs and discard the old tipika, the time-tested rules that helped regulate monastic life, not only do they show their lack of tradition, but they also show disrespect for tradition. Of course, eventually, they will realize the usefulness of of the rules they had changed. They were put there for a purpose. The rules and time-old practices of monasticism are carefully weighed. They are based on experience. You see, the same holds true for the rules of a craft. We must respect them. I was a carpenter, and I knew that a regular table is 80 centimeters high and a step is 27 centimeters wide. These are proven measures, and an apprentice must accept them as they are. No explanation is necessary. They are the result of experience, and we must trust the craftsman and respect his expertise. When one does not respect the rules of a craft, he will not do his job right. The table he builds will either be too low or too high. I have changed many calivia. This makes me a kafso calivitis. Pun on the literal meaning of the term kafso calivitis, hot burner. A monk who constructs for himself a calivi a hut from leaves and branches, lives in it for a time, and then burns it and moves to another location. See the life of St. Maximus the Capsocalivitis. 
Every time I made changes in the doors or the hooks, I realized that things had been put there for a good reason. This is why whenever I move to a new place, I don't make any immediate changes, even if I am uncomfortable with my surroundings. I won't even remove a single nail from the wall. The father who was in the Kalivi before me had put them there for a reason. I have no experience of the place, so if I take all the nails out, I will eventually have to put them back in the same spot and ruin the plaster. Nails are there for a reason, to hang a sweater, a cassock. Once I went to live in the Keli of Hipatio in Katunakya, and I found in all its corners thick walking sticks with curved ends. I started giving them as gifts to people who came to visit me. Later, I realized that the father that used to live there kept them handy for catching the many snakes that were there. The most important thing is to hold on to time-tested things. Otherwise, tradition goes away and transgression sets in. How different the two are. Tradition, paradosis, and transgression, paravasis. Some would like us to make transgression our tradition. There are monasteries today that do as they please and consider themselves traditional, when in fact they are transgressional. How can there be a spiritual discernment without spiritual sensitivity? You see, in monasticism, we must follow a different rule, not a military rule, or the rule of a movement, a cooperative, and so on, but the one and time-tested rule of monasticism, the rule set by the Holy Fathers. People often use the term patristic as their own theoretical understanding of monasticism and the Fathers. But this in reality is nothing but a pseudo-tradition, the conception of those who have only read patristic writings but not lived them. Some new monasteries today operate like charitable institutions. This is somewhat justified because they found very little in the manner of a foundation. Still, they could have sought the advice of older monasteries. When Ottoman rule was over, the first monasteries had no spiritual foundation. The Bavarians, who came to rule Greece under King Otto, tried to dissolve all existing monasteries and confiscate their property. They even issued a decree that monks should get married in order to dismantle monastic communities. In 1832, Otto, Prince of Bavaria, a region in former duchy and kingdom of southern Germany, was installed as king of Greece with the backing and protection of the great powers of Europe, England, France, and Russia. Otto ruled Greece with a staff comprised solely of Bavarians until 1862, when he was at last dislodged. The period during which Otto ruled Greece is known as the Bavarian rule and produced negative consequences in general for both the Orthodox Church and all of Greece. On the other hand, monastics at the time did not explore how monasticism had been in the past in order to return to tradition. People, for instance, noticed that monasteries had cows, calves, and so on, and they concluded, that's what monasticism is all about, raising cattle. But the reason that monasteries kept animals was because during Ottoman rule, people would donate their livestock and property to monasteries 
to keep them from falling to the hands of the Turks. It was to the monasteries that people went to find food, shelter, and support from all sorts of difficulties and dangers. It was there in the monasteries that people, especially the poor and the suffering, found help and consolation. At the time, there were no charitable institutions, and so monks were obliged to take care of both animals and people. Later, when things changed, they continued to raise farm animals and crops. This led some spiritual people to say, This unfortunately is our monastic tradition. And so they looked to the West and copied Western models of monasticism, borrowing from them the whole idea of missionary work. They never looked back at our tradition to find out how things had been or to think, well, that's what Ottoman rule bequeathed to us. Monks could not live an authentic monastic life under those circumstances. What we see is a remnant of this unhealthy situation. We should now go back to tradition. But instead of returning to our tradition, they turned to a Western model. They took examples from there and tried to apply them here. This is the mistake they made. They did not go back to our tradition. You see, the Turks had great respect for the Vakufs, religious charitable foundations, because they often benefited from our saints. Having witnessed many of the saints' miracles, they came to our monasteries, looking for God's help rather than hospitality. Dear listeners, our time is up. Thank you for listening. We will continue once again where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. Readings of Orthodox Spirituality Wondrous journey into orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekeak.